welcome to Aura Shorts. We hope you are all well, safe, and very busy with your work. <laughs> it's a good thing. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on our deep dive into the topic of TM30 and color rendition. We're here to learn what it is and what's new, but the main focus will be on how to really use TM30 to evaluate products and to create bulletproof specifications that work for you. Our presenter today is Chris Small. Chris is the head of the global sales team at Lumino, based out of London. His passion for lighting and the science behind LED technology has driven him to educate people all over the world on TM30 since its inception. Fun fact, he is a self-professed color nerd. <laughs> at the end of Chris's TM30 presentation, we will stop to answer any questions you might have. Feel free to add your questions to the chat bar. Uh, after the TM30 dis discussion and question and answer session, Chris is going to share some of Lumino's sleek, small scale linear products. They're high design and high performance. You'll want to stay tuned. Finally, toward the end of our program, we will introduce phase two of the Aura Odyssey Challenge. For those of you unfamiliar with this challenge that we've been doing with designers, uh, we have challenged a few of your peers who have, well, have graciously, oh my gosh, graciously volunteered to complete our mission of moving all mankind to a new planet in the year 2121. Each crew will be given a theme and a task to complete using resources provided by a sponsoring manufacturer. We're counting down to lift off. All right, let's go TM30. It's my pleasure to welcome from across the pond, our guiding light of color theory, Chris Small. Welcome to Aura Shorts, Chris. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Chris, uh, for many years, the industry has just accepted CRI as a measurement for color rendition, but TM30 appears to be CRI on steroids. Is it more compared, it has more comparison points for color fidelity, plus it examines saturation and hue, but how uh, do we use this data in lighting design? And is it readily available for manufacturers? That is a very good question. And hopefully within the next 30 minutes, uh, every single person sitting there watching this right now will be able to answer that question. So um, if you're okay, we will get going. Please take it away. Okay, so um, the whole idea of this is to make sure that you guys can use TM30 to specify products. Um, TM30 was released in, in 2015. Um, and until now, there hasn't really been that much guidance on how to use it in specification in the real world. So hopefully this will give us some insight into that. Um, it is going to be brief. It's going to um, be quite a quick run through on a very, very complex topic. So if you do need any more information on it, speak to the guys at Oblaney Rinker and we can arrange to come in and give you a more in-depth review of this um, and help you out with some more information. So to give you a bit of background about um, myself and about the company I work for, so I, I work for Lumino. Um, we are manufacturers of um, mostly linear, but um, LED lighting. We have been in the industry for about 36 years now. We're based over in the UK, across the pond, just outside London. Um, and really what we do is based entirely around creating um, lighting for lighting designers and lighting professionals. So we're very much um, focused on quality and fo focused on uh, giving designers and lighting professionals the products they need to do their job. So as you can see by the map there, we have projects and representation across the world um, from the guys at Oblaney Rinka over in New York where you are, um, over to us guys in the UK and across the world over to as far as New Zealand um, where we have distributed Distributors. So we really do um, kind of global scale on all sorts of projects for some really big name clients. Um, so we have experience with all kinds of projects and all kinds of applications. So enough about us, on to the topic at hand, TM30. So unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to go through and give you a full rundown on TM30. We simply don't have the time for it. Um, maybe if we had two or three hours, we could do that, but that's for another time, I think. Um, hopefully, Everyone that's attending will have some understanding of TM30 by now. Um, but if you don't, again, we can do that another time. What you need to know is TM30 is a tool for lighting professionals. It is a tool that gives you um, a robust and really in-depth way to describe color rendering. 
it's more information than has ever been given before on color of a light source. Um, and you'll be pleased to know as of 2018, it is now an American standard. So why is it relevant to you as specifiers and how can you use it? So I'm gonna pick on two things right now. We're gonna pick on the lead and well certification just to give you an example of why this is applicable to the specification process in your daily roles. Um, as I said before, TM30 contains really detailed information. You don't need to use all that information, but some of that information is really good. And it's information that you previously did not have about color rendering and the quality of that color. So how do we apply it to the specification process? So if we look at TM30 and how that is um, included in the well standard, uh, the, the certification for the well standard, um, previously you would have just had a CRI metric for the point that you get for color rendering quality. Now for circulation areas, this is CRI 80. This is not too difficult to achieve. Um, and if you look just under where it says CRI and CRI 80 there, um, you have the IAS TM3018, which would be updated to TM3020 and is essentially the same thing. And lots of letters and numbers and symbols, which do look quite complex. Now they do look complex. Um, however, once you get to know what those are and what they refer to, it's actually quite simple. Where this comes in really handy is for other areas. So any area except circulation areas. This is where um, CRI is required to be 90 or above. Now, again, there's plenty of light sources out there for that, but not all of them are affordable. Not all of them give us the lumen output we, we require. And sometimes it's just not practical to go with a source for CRI 90 plus. So how can you get around that? Well, this is where TM30 steps in. So if you look at the TM30 requirement there, you have the first thing is um, ignore all the IES bits in there. It just means that it's part of TM30. So the first thing is the RF, fidelity. Now, fidelity is uh, similar to a CRI score, and it says here the fidelity has to be 78 or above. OK, so that is similar-ish to CRI, but a lot lower than CRI 90. The RG, which is the gamut index, now that has to be over 100 or equal to. And then there's another thing here which uh, has a very catchy name of RCSH1, and that's to do with uh, shifting chroma, so the saturation or desaturation of color. And that specifically looks at colors in the red area, similar to the R9 for CRI. Now, within here, they are asking for that to be a minus 1% saturation or up to 15% oversaturation. When we take a look at USGBC lead certification, it gets a little bit simpler. Rather than just saying CRI 90, they now have the fidelity index for TM30 equal to or greater than 78, and a gamut index of between 97 and 110. So they've made it a little bit simpler with the TM30 data that you need. Um, and that is actually, when we look at it, a little bit lower than what we would expect of a CRI 90 source. So how can we take that into consideration? So this graph here shows you lots of colored dots and those colored dots are split into three different sections. So the yellow ones are the ones we're concentrating on. They represent commercially available luminaires. And the plot of this graph here on the bottom is the CIARA. So that's your CRI score. On here, it's only showing 50 to 100. And we know that we are looking at sources over 90. So on the right hand side of that red line where that red arrow indicates. So all of the sources, the yellow dots on the, the right hand side of that line would fit into the category where they would be accepted by both LEED and WELL certification. On the left hand axis, you've got the TM30 RF, the fidelity score. Now, if you remember, that was supposed to be fidelity of 78 or over. So if you are looking at the fidelity score, you now have a different reference. So you need something of 78 or above. That puts you in a position where you can potentially use anything, any of those yellow dots above that horizontal red line. So where the arrow indicates. And as you can see by the triangle on here, 
that indicates that you could use a whole lot more sources. Now, just by my estimation, that's probably double the amount of commercially available light sources that you could potentially use within the application and still be in compliance with LEED and WELL certification. Now that's a real world example of how this could help. Now you'll notice that I have said these may now comply and not these will now comply because there are other things which um, the LEED and WELL standard both call out for. The LEED calls out for gamut index and the WELL standard also calls out for gamut but also the specific chroma shift within the red part of the spectrum. So let's just take a quick recap on color rendering metrics and take a look at CRI versus TM30 before we look at actually how we can determine whether things meet these criteria. So CRI uses um, a reference source, which is a black body radiator, a, the theoretical perfect light source of any color temperature up to 5000K. And it compares the color rendering of the black body radiator, the reference source against a test source using color swatches. Those color swatches are indicated here on this slide as R1 through R8. Now you'll see those are quite pastel swatches. They're not very representative of the colors and the, the textures that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and those eight are still the standard to this day. So when you see a CRI number, it is on those eight swatches. You will also see R9 through 15. Now you can be given an RA14 figure. Now the RA14 figure gives you not only the score for R1 to eight, but also R9 through 14, not 15. 15 is supposed to be a skin tone, but it is um, not one that we found a match for so far. And as you know, there's many different skin tones, so it's not really a good representation of, of skin texture or skin color. You'll notice R9, which is the red color there, the most vibrant one. Um, this is particularly uh, difficult for LED to, to render properly because LED starts with a single blue wavelength and the phosphor on that LED actually um, transforms that light into white light rather than blue light. So R9, red being the opposite side of the spectrum, more difficult for that to render. Now, if we look at that versus TM30, we immediately see a huge difference. The biggest difference there is that there is an additional 91 color swatches to compare against. It's important to say here that the reference source, the black body radiator is still the same at the same color temperatures, depending on what you're measuring, up to 5,000 K. For the purposes of what we're doing, we're just gonna call it the black body radiator and we're gonna forget everything above 5,000 K. So what you're looking at there are 99 color swatches. These are off, um, taken from across the spectrum, um, fairly equally distributed across the spectrum, different saturations, different hues and chroma. And what you've got there are real life colors. They are not just taken from a hundred year old color swatches. They are real life colors from uh, plastics and printed materials through to skin and textiles and nature tones. So what you've got is a really robust number of swatches that give you a much better indication of how this performs in the real world. Then we look at the actual metrics. So the measures that we have within them, we're gonna start with CRI because we're more familiar with that. So CRI gives us three uh, measures as, as standard. The first one, RA, is a measure of fidelity. So when we're talking about fidelity, we're talking about how close we are rendering, the test source is rendering to the reference source. So it's basically a how close you are to a bullseye, hence the bullseye symbol there. And that is measured on zero to 100. So 100 being as close as possible, zero being as far away as possible. RA14 is essentially exactly the same thing, but with the additional color swatches in there. So it gives you a little bit of a better idea and you tend to see a small drop between RA and RA14. But again, it's a bullseye metric, it's a fidelity metric, and it's telling you how close you are to the reference source. R9, again, is exactly the same thing, but just for one swatch. It is just simply for that red R9 swatch. And that gives us an indication, but not a detailed uh, description of how it renders red or potentially warmer colors. What you'll see there is there's a question mark. So it, it's not a zero to 100 scale. It is actually a bottomless scale. You can get 
um, minus figures. You can get negative figures for R9. And if you've seen um, some lower color rendering sources, you may well have seen a negative R9 figure. So let's take a look at TM30. TM30, as you can see, has a lot more information already. These are the four standard metrics that you get. And we start at the top with a fidelity index. The fidelity index is the closest thing you're going to get to CRI um, RA8. Now, that again is this bullseye. How close are you to the reference source? And it is 0 to 100, but it's over those 99 samples. If we just skip to the bottom quickly and look at that other bullseye symbol, you have the very catchy RFH1, which is the red local color fidelity. That again tells you how close you are to the reference source when you are just looking at one small area. Now that area is the red area of the spectrum and that's indicated with that red triangle below it um, with the label one. And that within TM30 speak is called hue angle bin one. But for this, we're just going to call it the red area of the spectrum. Now there's another two metrics there with the colorful symbols next to them. The first one is gamut index. Gamut index is telling you about the saturation and hue shift within um, between the reference and the test source. Now the great thing about this is for the first time we're talking about do colors over or under saturate, not just how close they are to a reference. So you'll notice it goes up to 150 rather than 100. If you're scoring 100, again, that's exactly the same as the reference source. Over 100 up to 150 is an oversaturation in color on average over all of those references. And under 150 is an undersaturation on average. So it gives us an idea on the saturation of the colors there. And then underneath that, we have RCSH1, which is the local chroma shift. And that is talking about the shifting chroma, so the over under saturation, just within that hue angle bin one, within the red area. And that's for a minus 95% saturation to a plus 85% saturation. So again, it's telling us, are we over or under saturating, but just in that area? So we have many, many more bits of information there. Again, I can go over all of this in more detail and we can do a, a detailed just you know, learning TM30 um, session for whoever wants that. So TM3018, as it says there, is uh, an upgrade from TM3015. But again, we have another upgrade, which is TM3020. Now, this is, this is the latest version, and this is the version that really matters because for the very first time, they've given us some recommendations for specifying using TM30. So what we have th here is the latest update. TM3020 is approved as American National Standard. And it has two annexes, E and F. We are going to ignore Annex F because it is evidence supporting Annex E. And for what we're doing, we don't really need to worry about that. But for Annex E, this is what we're really interested in. This is how to use TM30 to specify products. So Annex E, uh, recommendations for specifying light source color rendition, looks at three separate things. It takes into consideration subjective qualities. It takes into consideration objective qualities and also task performance. And the whole thing is based on those three um, ideas, those three qualities, subjective, objective, and task performance. Um, these, as I said before, um, were the four measures that you get from that. Um, I'm not gonna go through those in detail. I've put a link in there, which I'll make sure that everyone gets sent out. Um, but basically, this is a description, the characterization, interpretation of those four um, measures, which we described briefly earlier. So what we're looking at here is the information that they give you within TM3020 to help you specify. It looks crazy, it looks complex, and it looks really difficult to understand. However, after we've been through this, I hope you will uh, have a very good understanding of how to use this. It does take a little bit of um, getting your head around, but this gives you the basics that you need to understand it. So what we're looking at here is the three design intents. So they've split how to specify into these three design intents. Pref color preference is talking about evaluations of uh, how pleasant something is to look at, the naturalness of something, how acceptable it is, and other things like that, which are subjective evaluations. Um, color vividness, the next column, is um, all about 
how much something stands out, how much a color stands out, the saturation or the vibrancy of those colors. So um, you'll see on the left, there's priority levels for these different things. Um, and as you go up towards priority level one, and so for example, vividness, priority level V1, that is saying that vividness, the, the vibrancy of the colors is the most important thing um, within that design intent. It might be less important to have really vivid colors. You might want them more natural and therefore you would put that down to V2 or maybe even V3. And then finally, color fidelity. This is going back to our bullseye metric of how close we are to the reference source. F1 being, I want it as close to the reference source, this theoretical perfect light as possible. F3 being the furthest away from that. And you know it doesn't really matter as much. What you will notice on the right hand side is we have a, uh, a graph chart here, which basically represents all of the um, design intents and their priorities within uh, a graphical interface. What we need to do is we need to choose three of these that overlap. So three priority levels within the three design intents that overlap with each other. So for example, if you were choosing F1, for fidelity, then you wouldn't be able to choose V1 because they are not able, uh, they, they are um, measures that are not able to match. So how do we actually use this? Firstly, we look at application. So everything is, is completely based on the application that you're looking for. And that's one of the really important things of TM30. You can't just say everything needs to be RF 90 RG 100 and above. It really depends on the application. If you are looking at a uh, high-end retail application versus a general office application, they will be very, very, very different criteria for choosing your luminaire. They may have some of the same luminaires, but the criteria you come out using this system will be very different at the end of it. So we, des we determine the design intents and priority levels. So we may choose um, a preference P1, and we may choose a vividness V2, and if we look on the chart on the right, the P1 and V2 overlap. And the only fidelity we can choose for that is F3. So when we look at the, um, what was it, P1, um, V2, and F3, we get some success criteria within the priority levels and design intent chart on the left-hand side. What we need to do is we need to take the fidelity, the gamut, the, um, the chroma shift in hue angle bin one and the fidelity of hue angle bin one. And those are then our criteria for sorting potential sources for the specification. So it will give you at the very least the four metrics, the four measures, sorry, that you need. And it will tell you the criteria that those need to meet. Now you don't have to use all of them. You can just say, I want fidelity and gamut and I'm not too concerned about the, the specific red stuff, but it really gives you um, a, a bit more of a bulletproof um, criteria for sourcing things for specification. We can go through any questions on this at the end, um, if, if that's okay. Um, but the real burning question that a lot of people have, is this going to replace CRI? Well, unfortunately, this is between the CIE and the IES. Um, and as you can imagine, the Europeans and the Americans are not getting on with this. and both think that they've got the right thing. So this is a position statement by the IES. The IES have said that the CIE and IES do agree on one thing, which is that the core framework for the fidelity index is agreed upon. And actually in the new CIE 224, um, which is a kind of a, a calculation method for fidelity similar to TM30, it is the same as TM30 fidelity. So that thing, that fidelity index is exactly the same between CIE and the IES. However, that's the only thing they're able to agree on. And the bottom line here is that they are leaving the choice up to users. So that's you guys. The choice is down to you. If you think CRI works for you, you can still use CRI. You can use CRI and TM30 in, um, in tandem with one another, or you can just say, well, look, I know CRI is there, but actually TM30 works best for me. I understand it. I know what I'm doing and it gives me the information that I need in order to specify things properly. So unfortunately it is up to you guys, but you have the choice to use um, a bit of an ancient metric or something which is a little bit more up to date and gives you way more information. 
So that yeah. concludes the educational part of um, the presentation. Do we have any questions? We do. Thank you, Chris, for taking us through that very practical TM30 crash, co uh, crash course. I do no have problem. a few questions in the queue. Um, let's see. When testing uh, fixtures for TM30 color uh, properties, is there a specific type or standard of metering equipment that manufacturers must use? Uh, or for example, can a manufacturer use any available handheld spectrometer, but spectrometer <laughs> in the market and publish those results? Also, how much variance in reliability exists in the spectrometer market? Okay, so there's two really good questions there. The first one being, um, how do we measure this? And is it difficult to do? Um, and that's a really easy question to, to answer. The answer to that is it's super simple. If you measure for CRI, you already have the data you need to publish TM30. So this is all taken from the spectral distribution. The spectral distribution is exactly what they measure when you measure CRI. Um, and most handheld spectrometers now, um, we have several that we use, they will give you TM30 data at the click of a button. So you immediately have that TM30 data there. And I would advise anyone who um, is, is extremely interested in this and wants to know for themselves, um, you can pick these up for you know a thousand bucks. And I know that sounds might sound like a lot, but actually if, if you look in the grand scheme of things, just to be able to test things yourself and be 100% sure of what manufacturers are saying, that's really, really cheap. So you can get this really easily yourself and it is not something that's difficult. The only thing that um, manufacturers may need to do is download a $50 spreadsheet from the IAS, which spits out all the graphics and all the really nice data. But again, it's super simple, it's super easy. The second question is a little bit more difficult to answer. Um, and I guess the, the real answer is, it depends how much you spend. If you're spending a thousand bucks on a handheld spectrometer, you are not going to get the tolerances and the, um, the fine tolerances that you need um, to be 100% sure. I mean, they will give you what tolerances they have and it might be you know, plus or minus um, one or two here and there, or you know, when measuring um, color temperature, it might be plus or minus 50 Kelvin, for example. And then you're gonna get the lab equipment like we used to measure, and that's gonna be you know, to the closest single Kelvin. Um, so it depends on how much you're willing to spend. Is it going to be a thousand? Is it going to be 10,000? Gotcha. Um, do all of your fixtures have TM30 data posted, published? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Absolutely. We, we have, we, no, we do, we do have TM30 um, data for everything. As I said, it's super easy. Um, the only reason I hesitated there is because uh, I hope we haven't released any new products that don't have it with them yet. But um, no, we, we have that available for all of our, um, our different chips. Um, all of the chip data is available. Um, and we actually have a specific TM30 booklet, which has all of the TM30 data for all the different chips we offer in one booklet. Perfect. Um, and one more. Uh, what is the best score for the RF under the TM3015 code? 100. 100 is the best score you can score. Great. TM30, is it updated regularly like other codes? Um, so since it was first released in 2015, we've had 2018 and 2020. I don't know when they are looking at up, updating this again, um, but judging you know, historically, that's been once every two to three years. Um, I would expect that as research goes on, because there, are, there is a lot of research going on in this field, they would update this. Um, and, and I would say regularly check back with the IES to see where, where the latest update is. Or right. check with O'Blaney Rinker, because I will update them as soon as a new version comes out. Sounds good. Perfect. All right. Chris has a few Lumino products to share with us. Uh, these amazing indoor-outdoor products are all UL listed for the US market. They also have an entire line of international products as well. Take it away, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, before we just go straight into the products, I just wanna talk very quickly um, about us as a company and, and you know what we do and why we do it. Um, so we focus really heavily on quality, on quality of light, quality of the build, quality of the manufacture of, of our products. Um, and that means we don't just take um, a you know, 
product casing we've designed and just stick some LED in it. Um, we design everything from scratch, right from the bare bones of the product all the way through to the clips, the connectors that we use. Everything we use is designed in-house by our design team prototyped, tested, um, and we use very trusted manufacturing partners um, where we cannot manufacture in-house ourselves. That means that um, we have full control through the entire supply chain and through the entire manufacturing chain and everything is, is done to our exacting standards. The picture that you see there is actually um, our LED chips being placed on our flexible PCB. Um, this is the very first step in our quality control and these are being flash tested for their binning, um, excuse me, and for um, CRI checks. And this is one of the very first steps in, in the QC process, which actually has 12 different QC points throughout the build of the product. So we don't just talk about focusing on quality and talk about color quality. It is absolutely in our bones and it is in everything that we do. So where we go from there? I've got two products to show you. Like uh, Jennifer said, we've, we've got an extensive range of products, but I'm not going to bore you with all of that stuff today. I'm just going to tell you about some of my favorites and some of the things that I think are most relevant to you guys. So uh, V20 Optic, um, this is very fast becoming one of our best selling products. It is super versatile. It's a 20 by 20 millimeter, so just under an inch square um, profile. It comes in lengths from um, 100 millimeters up to two meters. Um, I can't do that conversion in my head, so I'm sorry. Um, and what you get is a, a very slim, a very sleek profile that is interior and exterior rated. So it's wet listed as well. Um, and you get beam control, you get various different outputs um, and you get glare control as well. So um, to give you uh, an idea, if you can see this, this is the size of the product. Um, it's very, very small. And we've got um, different lens options for that, all the way from um, a wash optic, a graze optic, and a flood optic. Um, and that has glare control, as you can see in there, anti-glare louver, which is integral. And that is all sealed IP67, so you can use that any way you want. This product, um, as I said, has fast become one of our best sellers because of its versatility. You can put this anywhere. We've had this on facade projects. We've had it in interior bathroom spaces. Um, in um, atriums, in office spaces. It really is a product that can go anywhere you can fit it and really performs um, as you need it to. There is also a diffused option um, available for those spaces where you don't need the optical control as well. Um, and as we practice what we preach there, um, we have all of the TM30 and color rendering data on our cut sheet. So this is just a small snip of our cut sheets. Um, we have color core and EQ, two of our chip um, uh, chip types there. And you can see the different um, color options that are available. And you can see the RA, R9, RF, and gamma index for all of those options. There's more detailed uh, TM30 data available, but this is just what we could cram onto our spec sheet, as well as uh, the different lumen outputs that you have there. That is a nice little application shot of this product um, in, installed. Um, we have this installed in this lovely project in Norway, which is uh, like a, a theater, community theater. Um, and it's washing down the core of the building there on those wooden slats. Um, it's a lovely, beautiful, warm color. It really gives um, a, a lovely level of light. And uh, what I really like about this is it's not only bringing out the warmth in the wood there, but it's giving a really good quality of light for the circulation areas as well. This is a project which you may have seen on the initial slides that Carl put up. This is uh, University of Birmingham in the UK, uh, and they have a huge landscape project there that we have just finished this year with, uh, or last year, sorry, with Spears Major. Um, and we had some V20 optic in various areas here, um, as well as uh, another product, which is essentially the big brother of V20 optic, which is our V36 optic. So this is the surface mount version. Um, it is slightly larger with 36 mil width, so about um, inch and a half ish um, width. Um, we have a slightly different optic package in here. So we have collimated optics. Each individual chip has its own optic on the top of that, which gives it a really nice clean beam. This is much higher output. So you're looking at up to 1100 lumens per foot. 
um, we have three different beam angles an 18 18 by 45 and 37 degree and we've got two different louver options there um, these come in all different rail colors um, these are um, listed for interior and exterior again um, and to be perfectly honest these again are products that you, you can use anywhere um, that you can fit them uh, and i've got uh, another little sample here so to give you an idea of the scale again this is still quite a small product it's not huge um, but this is one of the larger products that we make everything really with us is is kind of micro sized um, so comparing that v36 to the v20 gives you an idea of the two sizes there um, and where you might be able to use them sorry I'm, my background is uh, <laughs> cutting a lot of this out again we practice what we preach and you've got the tm30 data there on the cut sheet um, now that one is um, only available in our color core range rather than our eq um, and if i just quickly was back to that i'll just give you a brief um, description of the two of those sorry so you'll see here color core and eq um, they are both uh, our chip families uh, the color core is our kind of standard high quality chip this is a, a two-step bin 95 cri um, and the higher lumen output package and then the eq is exactly the same quality it's made in the same way in the same factory um, but you've just got a three-step bin with 90 cri uh, and a slight trade-off on lumen output so still in terms of uh, quality they're both very good quality chips both 90 cri plus um, and both have fantastic uh, TM30 scores, but the uh, the ability to take it to a three-step bin just makes it a little bit more economical for the, uh, the client at the end of it. And I will leave you on another nice little project application there while I answer some questions, which is uh, a Nike store that we have um, fitted out in Paris. Um, and you can see actually some V20 the diffused version in the window reveal but also some v36 washing behind the um, merchandise there so thank you all very much for for listening to me go on about products at the end of that i hope everything was useful for you um i think we might have another couple of questions is that right jen we do how does your warm dim work in terms of wiring and what is the range okay our warm dim um, is a uh, 3000 to 1800k um, and the wiring is just two wires so all of the dimming is on board so as long as it is PWM dimming on the low voltage side of the driver then all the dimming is done for you. Uh, and for CRI sometimes it can be the same for 27 and 35k does the same go for TM30? So the, the CRI, uh, well, the, the fidelity index for the color that you're measuring is based on um, a reference of the same color temperature. So um, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's possible to have exactly the same TM30 data for a 2700K source and a 3500K source. Um, however, it's not necessarily linked to the color temperature. Um, and it really is just to do with the, the spectrum of light that comes out of that and how well that compares to a theoretical perfect source of the same color temperature. I hope that answers that well enough. Yes. Thank you very much. All right, awesome. All right, we're gonna move on. Uh, thank you. If you would like any additional information on products, please shoot us an email, contact your old ring for contact. Um, you know, we also have samples available, so just let us know. We're gonna move on to our Aura Odyssey Challenge. Uh, in phase one, we laid the foundation on our new planet, creating sources of food, shelter, and energy. As we shift our focus to phase two, we're interested in preserving culture. Please enjoy this short introduction to our upcoming designer challenge. Carl?
On our next, at next Aura Shorts, we'll reveal the participants and their sponsors. Well, that completes our shorts for today. Thank you again. Uh, remember that our complete Aura Shorts uh, references are all on our YouTube page, so please check it out if you've missed one of our episodes. Also, please note that our Pinterest page is freshly stocked with images and inspiration from our manufacturing partners, so please feel free to check it out. Mark your calendars for the next shorts on May 20th. Until then, thank you, Chris Small and Lumino, and thanks everybody for your attention. This was fun. Take care.